Hello and welcome. You're watching us live from the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. You're watching a session that's going to discuss the tools, the policies, and uh, the plans that we need in order to be able to reignite growth on the African continent. When the economic history of the continent is going to be written, I'm certain that uh, we will be talking about uh, one of the key chapters in that, the very first part of the 21st century. I don't know how many of you uh, will remember the lines on the move uh, that were written by McKinsey, of course, when we were talking about that very long stretch of growth that we saw on the African continent. Uh, what about uh, the condemnation that we got from the Financial Times about the hopeless continent, all superseded, of course, uh, when we got that growth uh, going. We meandered a little bit uh, when we came into the uh, 2015s to the 20, uh, 20s, but I am suggesting that perhaps we could be sitting here on the cusp of a long stretch of growth that could well rival what we saw uh, in the uh, first part of the 21st uh, century. I have the speakers who I am going to ask to make sure they back that argument. Let me introduce them. On my left, uh, Governor Njeroge, uh, the Central Bank of Kenya, is on the panel. Thank you, sir, for coming through. Thank you. Donkululeko Nyembezi, Chairperson, Standard Bank Group. Thank you, ma'am, for being with us. Professor Mtuling Lube, I was going to say chief economist. <laughs> no, not anymore. He has moved on. Finance Minister of Zimbabwe. <coughs> Vera Songwe, Executive Secretary, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. You've moved on, ma'am, as well. I've moved on, too. Oh, my. I need, I need to do my uh, reading properly. Thank you very much for coming through and uh, for joining us uh, in this session. Um, I'd like to begin uh, with you, uh, Vera. You sit... I think at a higher table than all of us, you look across at the continent. And uh, I wondered your insights in terms of those key things that you see that are perhaps uh, impeding growth and would need to be addressed for us to be able to kickstart growth again on the African continent in a more sustained way. No, thank you, first of all, and good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to, to see everyone. I think uh, uh, maybe uh, less about impeding growth and more about Exactly as you said, you know, what can we, how can we reignite it, right, and, 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 and turn some of the constraints into positives. And I think the first one is something that uh, we're all talking about here, and uh, the governor is here with me, and the uh, finance minister, chairperson. I think we're all uh, looking at how we come out of this current crisis, right, and, and the fact that we, we're living in what I would call the poly crisis or the four Cs. It's climate, it's uh, covid it's conflict on our continent and it's the cost of living, inflation. I think we've heard from uh, many uh, during this last few days about the fact that maybe because inflation in the West is tapering, we will no longer see rises in interest rates. What does that do for us? And this is a little bit your question, is essentially it tightens our fiscal space. When it tightens our, it tightens our fiscal space on the public sector side, it increases rates on the private sector side, and so interest rates become very difficult uh, uh, for us to meet. Actually, a lot of African economies are priced out of the market uh, uh, right now, and we cannot go back to the market to raise any resources that can actually help us with investment. So I think if we can fix that, you know, this is the first sort of big overarching problem, is how does the rest of the world you know, get its act together, bring inflation under control, bring down rates, so that we can unlock Africa's growth. Because today, a lot of that growth is being locked up in the decisions that are made on this one item, which is inflation, and if we can fix that. The second big thing for me is climate, and we've talked a lot about it here. And I see climate again for as sort of the huge opportunity for the continent. The other sort of, I think, most repeated word in the last few days has been supply chains and supply chain disruptions. The beauty of it is that a lot of those supply chains start on our continent and can finish on our continent if one decided to transform our raw materials into finished goods on the continent. It will create jobs, it will add value, it will increase uh, uh, our, our sort of involvement and our trade, AFC, FTA will be, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, put on autopilot. So the supply chain, which today is talked to us as a constraint, can actually be fixed on the continent with climate change, change and looking for better sourcing. And the last thing is our youth. Our population structure is probably the best for growth mm. that anybody else has. 
But what we need to now do is reskill that youth to be the youth. You know, in 2050, one in every person walking on the planet will be African. That African will be delivering the sustainability, that African will be borrowing. So rates, climate, and who is going to be the actor around it is the youth that we need to make sure that we skill to be ready and prepared for it. Yeah, thank you, Vera. Thank you, Vera. In the meantime, what I did was uh, I went very quickly on Google to <laughs> give you your proper title. Uh, that's uh, <clears throat> uh, Chairwoman of the Board of the Liquidity and Sustainability Facility. Of course, ex-head of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Minister, let me come to you. Um, it's been suggested that uh, we are asking you to do the impossible. We're asking you to uh, find resources when your fiscal space is extremely tight. Uh, we are asking you to make sure that every good is finances when you are fighting liquidity issues. At the same time, we are also saying to you, please find ways in which we can reduce our indebtedness so that we're not paying most of our money to go to paying those debts um, that we got in the past. Is that an impossible task? Are we being unfair? It's certainly a very tough task. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is a very tough task. But I see opportunities as well. Uh, uh, to me, actually, it's quite exciting as a policymaker. I'm always very excited to tackle these very uh, tough issues. Uh, I think that let's just make sure as, as policymakers, we stay on the fiscal uh, consolidation path. Uh, we have to try very hard to live within our means right now because the cost of borrowing is high and our de debt levels are rising and we have to live with, within our means. We need to be creative as to how we use our government balance sheets. So one of the things that we're doing, uh, at least what, what I've been doing, is actually a, 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 you know, issuing out government guarantees for certain private sector investment in order to, to crowd in private capital. We're doing that in the solar uh, you know, energy space, talking about the climate change opportunity, mm -hmm. investing in solar energy. So, so basically extending government guarantees on power purchase agreements. So I'm expecting to unlock about 1,000 megawatts in the next you know, couple of years from that you know, kind of arrangement. And it's just, just one way to be creative about government balance sheet when things are, are, are not so, 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 so easy. Um, there are other areas. We, we, for instance, the issue around <coughs> the disruptions in global supply chains, that it's also a call for making sure that we're self-sufficient in certain areas. For example, in, in, in the area of just wheat production, when the world is, cannot find wheat easily because of the global tensions, last year we were able to produce a record crop, you know, more than 380,000 metric tons of wheat, the first time we have been self-sufficient in 50 years. Why? Because we accelerated investment in, the, uh, in dam construction, uh, you know, making sure that we can impound the water, invest in irrigation, and then on to the fields in terms of uh, wind production. So some very simple things in terms of how to cleverly use public sector investment to make sure that we are part of that uh, global uh, supply chain. The, the other area, talking again about supply chain disruptions uh, and climate change and so, so forth, is the area of uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, lithium. In the area of lithium, we have actually imposed a ban on, on the export of raw lithium and processed li lithium to the rest of the world, would want beneficiation to take place in Africa, in Zimbabwe, whether it's Zimbabwe, Zambia, you know, DRC, South Africa, where you find some of this lithium, mm. it, sh it should happen there. And then, you know, companies should only export a, you know, a lithium concentrate and, and go further, and then it produce batteries locally. I mean, why, why not? All, all that is, 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 is critical. Uh, you know, for in terms of policy making. So, so I'm, I'm excited about, about the opportunity, about the challenge, uh, uh, you know, let me stop here uh, for now. Yeah, thank you, Minister. I wanted to tell you that uh, I am going to take the issues that you have raised and uh, your strategy to crowd in the private sector. I will put it to the private sector person that we have on the panel and ask if it's enough because you have to be able to win your confidence for her to bring in the capital that you need that you are talking about. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to leave you for last though. I'm coming to the governor here. Governor, from your perspective, um, you know, as uh, consumers, um, as, uh, am I calling myself, pseudo-economists, this is us in the press who write about business and talk about business, we are struggling with tightening at a time when economies are struggling to grow. We are struggling with uh, the logic that says we need to kill the inflation dragon first before we're able to uh, resuscitate uh, the growth that we require. How difficult a balancing act is it in this environment? Thank you, Godfrey, and uh, good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. 
and distinguished panel. Um, I think the, uh, the problem was set up by Vera and then the concerns that the minister raised are very much um, apropos. It's really on the money. Um, but your question is about ourselves as uh, monetary authorities um, and uh, the balance that we, we must strike. In effect, everything is a balancing act. There's no two ways about it. There's no um, one element that, uh, um, that maybe should be considered without considering others. And inflation is precisely that. We know on the one hand the concerns of inflation, what it does. Among other things, it's, uh, it hits the poorest the most. So if you look at the dragon, um, the people that it is consuming, um, or the people that uh, are adversely affected by it are actually the ones that, you, that have the least means um, for dealing with uh, various society concerns, etc. So that's one of the reasons why inflation is so, is so important, um, dealing with it, slaying that dragon. At the same time, we also understand that uh, uh, the, it really represents also a cost of living. So... In effect, what happens is when inflation gets out of hand, um, the cost of living and uh, the way people look at the economy and uh, um, their behavior gets altered. Mm -hmm. And uh, that in itself may end up taking us in a very inefficient equilibrium in the economy. Mm -hmm. So th for these and other reasons, it's essential for us, the monetary authorities, to deal with that issue. And that's why most central banks, most modern central banks, that is their number one priority. Inflation, fine. In dealing with uh, uh, price control, price stability, meaning uh, dealing with inflation, making sure that inflation doesn't get out of hand. And that mandate is something that you can see across our, you know, our region, um, the central banks across our region. And in effect, it is uh, all the others. It dominates all the others for the reasons I mentioned. So the actions that we take as monetary authorities, of course, um, will end up in some sense reducing um, immediate growth, yes. right? But uh, again, and that is understood, that's the balancing act I was talking about. But you should also look at it in the long term. If we don't deal with it today, there will be what we may call you know, an apparent growth um, sort of increase in the short run, but in the medium term, you'll end up losing um, the medium term growth. Um, so it is important to not be, uh, let's say, too, cons well, I guess, to appreciate that there's a balancing act and, mid and the current growth levels that we may see um, that we may, in some sense, give up in order to deal with inflation, yeah. will come back um, much more strongly in the yeah. medium term. Yeah, so short-term pain, hopefully for long-term uh, yeah, growth but, and comfort. But also appreciating that uh, there are other things that need to be done. Yes. Um, for instance, um, the minister can talk and actually mention some of the things that they may be doing in terms of protecting the poorest, et cetera, et cetera. So everything is in only monetary policy. That's the point I'm making. I hear you. Yeah. Maybe if you can jump in, Godfrey, on that, on protecting the poor. It's quite easy to get into the, you know, uh, this thing about giving out cash transfers. Just give them money to protect them against inflation and so yeah. on. But we can do better. By, by adopting what you call productive social protection. Yes. Yes. If you give rural farmers in Kenya, in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, in South Africa, seed, fertilizer, and agricultural extension service so they can produce for themselves. So the same amount of money you'd have used on cash transfers, switch to, to productive social protection. You deal with uh, food security, yeah. the, the food, you raise their incomes. It is a, a, a better way to certainly intervene on the social protection front. Yeah. It sounds good, Minister, but do we have examples of where that has worked? Oh, we're doing it in Zimbabwe. It's working very well. Yeah. We've impacted three million people in Zimbabwe. That way is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Vera, I see you are you nodding. No, I think since uh, uh, COVID, actually, since 2008, almost 20 African countries today have social protection uh, schemes in one way or the other, which are essentially work uh, as schemes as well, which produce more value. I think one of the big problems on the continent today is we would like for many more uh, countries to have this kinds of targeted, productive yeah. uh, transfer interventions, which 
grow value, create jobs, and, and, and in, essentially protect the poor. Yeah. Nku, let me come to you. I've made you listen to all of these people. Um, <laughs> so, so is everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted also to tell you uh, a name that I gave you that you don't know, that you are hearing here for the first time. Nku yeah. is one of South Africa's Iron Ladies. Oh, dear. If you ask me nicely, <laughs> I will tell you why she's an Iron Lady. Um, Nku, Nku, you have listened to the policymakers, you have listened to uh, the central bank talking about uh, what, from a central bank perspective, the choices, hard choices that they have uh, to make. I think we heard uh, uh, Chairman Jerome Powell the other day say, you know, sometimes the central bank governors will have to take difficult choices. But at the same time, they have to be difficult, sustainable choices. As a businesswoman, I want to know if you're hearing enough to enable you to release your capital so it's comfortable. I remember years ago someone saying, capital is a coward. If you do not look after it well, it will run very, very fast. There are many corners where it can go. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Godfrey. I think that we are on the way. The direction, at least from what I hear in the room and what I see, is correct. Um, what, for me, starts to become a little bit optimistic about this time is African governments have come to a point of the absolute limit of their capacity to do stuff. You know, they do not have the means. They have to tackle debt uh, as a matter of urgency. Inflation is a matter of urgency. In a scenario like that, it therefore opens the window, small window, for a private sector-led economic growth path. And I honestly cannot see how we accelerate African growth without that. It's one thing to think about crowding in the private sector, but that's not actually what I am talking about. I am talking about it is the private sector that leads this time around, not as a matter of ideology, right. but by a matter of <clears throat> pure pragmatic choice, because that is where we <clears throat> find ourselves. So if we were to recognize that we all have this real interest in Africa's growth and development, otherwise we wouldn't be here every year talking about it and going back home trying to make it happen, um, what is the bargain that we, together with the civic society, government, business, can strike in order to make this thing happen. So I think that's, for me, a very, very big part of what I would like to see us do as we move forward. So I'm truly spoke about the renewable energy path that Zimbabwe is on. South Africa has done that, and done that very successfully, where government said, we don't have the means to go down that path, but what we can do is to give you a flow. We'll give you some guarantees. You go and do this thing. And it became one of the most successful renewable yeah. energy yeah. Right. projects in, on planet Earth. Why sure. can't we do that with everything else? Sure. Um, so so you, if, if you give us trade facilitation and some kind of protections there <coughs> for X of public sector money, you can get 10X in terms of value created because the private sector moves in. So this is really... The idea, I mean, it is exactly what the Chinese did, where they just let loose the animal spirits in their private sector mm. to unleash growth and, and, and literally just take off. Yeah, yeah. So sadly, across sub-Saharan Africa, that has not been the case. Uh, there have been many ideologically driven decisions taken, including in my own country. I'm glad you're the one who mentioned that because I was coming with it. <laughs> Um, and it did seem at some point that governments really believed that development only happens if government drives development. Well, that particular experiment has not yielded the hope for benefit. So, so let's do the simple things and <coughs> get... So, so, so perhaps, truly, what I'm saying is Ooh. government gets out of the way a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, I'm happy to get out of the way. Well, I can give you a practical example from just the conversation we've had. So if what you want to do is to beneficiate lithium, before you ban ex the export of lithium, you better have spoken to the private sector to see what the appetite is, what the constraints might be, what will you actually achieve this, or is this got just this kind of idea of a dream? Um, it's not the wrong Even thing since to Since we banned uh, two private sector, you know, 
investors have come forward within chain. three days. Your supply chain. Yeah. Yeah. That, that Which would, is fantastic. You, fine, but I'm just saying, that's exactly what I'm driving to, that you, you better have had this conversation yeah. and know that this is actually grounded on reality that can be made to, or that can materialize. So, so just the last point, uh, Godfrey, before I give you back the mic, um, clearly there's been uh, sort of this buzz of excitement about the free trade agreement. Uh, uh, AFCFTA. AFCFTA. Don't worry, I say it every single day. <laughs> yes. Now, um, we all really support it, at least I do, and I, I know many business people who do. And as difficult as these trade agreements are in reality to bring to life, they will not also come to life without the private sector picking this up and operationalizing it uh, where they are. <coughs> we are not making a huge amount of progress, and it is, in my mind, because there was this divergence between the public sector that went into the rooms to negotiate the thing, say, here it is. Off you go, folks. Um, and now there's a scramble to try and see how we make this thing work. Had we then gone into it together right from the start, yeah. we may be at a different place because perhaps it could have been tackled a little bit differently. <coughs> so there's just a need for me to just rethink uh, the way that we work together. And you know, this idea that there's no trust between the two just needs to disappear because it's really a 20th century concept. Yeah. Governor, you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, two, two points. Thank you uh, for, the present, for mm -hmm. your intervention. But I think two points I'd want to put on the table. First, um, it means really clarity of rules more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So the public sector needs to set rules, whatever they are, laws, etc., and then stick to them. Mm -hmm. yeah? So I think the issue of negotiating with government, I have a lot of trouble with that. Um, there's a private sector, let's say, portion that loves getting concessions, et cetera, and they all come <laughs> under the uh, edges of, yeah, you know, subsidies. more employment, et cetera, et cetera. I think we all have many, uh, let's say, cautionary tales like that. So I think for me, the first thing is clarity about rules, et cetera, and sticking with them. Mm -hmm. And of course, they have to be. Secondly, AFT, the African free trade, continent of free trade area. I don't know if I would, my assessment of it would be as dire as uh, we have uh, mentioned a moment ago. Um, I think it is true that uh, on the surface, we haven't seen that much, um, let's say, trade, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But actually, there has been a lot of work that has been done, in a sense, preparing the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, and I would probably say before this, uh, the private sector can move and do all these things. Yeah. First priority are financial institutions. The other ones that actually go and secure beachhead, yes. right? In case if you want to have transactions and all that. And actually today now you can see a lot of Pan-African banks yeah. that are moving around. Yeah, yeah. We just had uh, a few Kenyan banks move to DRC. We just had, uh, um, anyway, and the story is wider. It's not just uh, along that axis. We also have across west, south, yeah. central. Um, and again, other things that we have done, you know, the payment system, also starting that. Mm -hmm. So I think we are putting in place what I'll call the the supporting infrastructure. Yeah, but Governor, should yes. that supporting infrastructure have been put in place before we did the celebratory party, before we did the fanfare? No. And I think all. it Not goes to all. the point that Nku was raising about talking to us before you go and you pronounce. Not no, at no, all. But, we, but for us to realize the yeah. Africa uh, continental, continental free trade area opportunity, we have to invest in it. Yes. Actually, by, by investing in it, you're actually benefiting from it. Whether it's Standard Bank going Pan-African, or an uh, equity bank from Kenya going Pan-African. That's part of the story. Investing in one-stop border post, investing in infrastructure ac across borders, launching cargo airlines that are, 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 are Pan-African. All that is trying to do, to, to, we are investing in the opportunity and harnessing the opportunity at the same time. It can't just happen without investing in it. Sarah? No, I, I think, listen, the, if one were to do a report card on the AFCFTA today, um, we certainly are doing very well. On the institutional side, and, and, and when we look around at our neighbors, 
uh, uh, the Europeans who have, you know, a, a free trade area agreement in the United States. It's a building, it's a, they're building blocks, the ASEAN. But what we have done on the AFCFTA, and, and so the celebratory party was very important, necessary and needed. First of all, it was to build the institutions and to bring the credibility to that idea, which is for Africa, our growth idea. Between the time when we started talking about the CFTA yeah. and today, you know, it was this conversation around, you know, uh, the spaghetti bowl of African trade agreements and all. We have reduced that substantially. And by doing that, a business that wants to come to the continent today, at the very least knows that if you go to Central Africa, you're facing the same things if you go to East Africa. Yeah. What we are now trying to do, rules of origin, huge fights that we had in yeah. terms of establishing yeah. that. We've won that fight. There's no way we cannot say that that's a huge... Uh, uh, and then if you look at South Africa, Nigeria, these are the countries that essentially are our sort of industrial machines. Yeah. And in Nigeria, there was so much consultation. In South Africa, inside the SADC region, already quite an, an amount of consultation. Of course, as we sort of change conversations, there will be more... You just said yourself around sort of the energy sector, how well South Africa has done and how the rest of the world is actually looking at you guys and saying, we're going to use those examples to do more. But I think we can say today with a lot of pride yeah. that the CFTA is on the move, the payment systems where you can now trade between Zimbabwe and Algeria without sort of, you know, put in place by Africa, Zimbabwe, and ADB. There is a lot that's happening yeah. on that, in that space. What we need from the private sector, yeah. because 80% of the growth in the CFTA is going to come from small and medium enterprises, women and, and the youth in particular as well, yeah. is to begin to create sort of we're doing the big financial infrastructure, yeah. the payment systems and sort of more access to financing for that segment. Yeah. I think there's a little bit more work we need to yeah. do. Yeah, so you're beginning to answer one of uh, the key questions that I need us to, uh, to discuss here, whether the CFTA is going to be the change maker that we are all have been talking about and have been asking for. But I wanted to go back to Nku and talk about what she referred to as one of the other issues that we're not having to deal with today. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you can see, I have been around a little bit I'm a child of uh, the 70s, the 80s, and in that period, we talked a lot about socialism, about communism, and I can tell you today, those are conversations of the past. But is it universal in terms of the approach to policy making? The point I'm making is that it may well be that we are now not hearing these other words a lot, but in terms of having to do business on the ground, those, that kind of thinking is still prevalent and preventing you from uh, lending as much as you would like to do? Hmm. Um, I, I don't want to give examples, but I can give examples if you want. If, if you would, please, because I'm a little bit lost. I, I don't think in the way that certainly business is conducted in financial services in South Africa, we get uh, blocked from a socialist type instinct? N not perhaps the governing party, but I'm sure you are aware, oh. of course, within the political space, well, look, I think what is true uh, in South Africa and I think in Africa uh, on the continent broadly is that the social need is great and that people do have a view that banks in particular should do something about that. Mm. Um, and if, you know, you assume that the bank reports all these wonderful profits, well, why aren't they doing more um, to uplift communities that need uplifting? I think there is, <coughs> in my mind, much more of pressure and push in that direction than almost anything else. Now, we do have, that's absolutely true, we do have still quite left-leaning politicians, maybe trade unionists that still want to nationalise the central bank uh, and, and various things like that. That's always going to be part of the conversation. It's a kind of bit of fun, I suppose, for some people. Mm. Uh, it can be damaging, uh, uh, totally, but uh, there is a centre there that believes that the way that we're dealing with those, those issues is, is correct. So I, I'm not particularly concerned about that. Governor? Yeah, I, I think there's something maybe to add to what was just mentioned, there's something that has changed. Um, I don't want to get into the sort of the isms, right, that you mentioned. I don't think that's the business, my business or the business that we are into. Mm -hmm. It's for political economists to do it later when we are done. Um, but there is a certain now, there's a clear acceptance of what I would call orthodox economics, right? So in terms of macroeconomic frameworks, but it, et cetera, 
the orthodoxy of those policies I, um, is now widely accepted across the continent. Now, it is orthodoxy, but with what you'd call a slice of lemon in it. Um, and the slice of lemon is more the things that we need to maintain our social concern. Mm. So we need to do things, not just leave our, let's say, the most <coughs> needy to their own devices. Um, and you could possibly also toss in an ice cube if you want. Um, <laughs> concern of things like the SMEs, et cetera. Yeah. So I think it is more um, a much richer orthodoxy yeah. that actually has benefited us. Um, the, the, the other point is just to look at what has happened during the COVID period. Right. If it were not for that sort of very clear, uh, let's say, refined orthodoxy, wouldn't be standing here, we'll be talking of very complicated issues that we have somehow managed to overcome over the last three years. Yeah. Um, you want to come in a minute? No. no. Okay. I, I was going to I move on because no. I, wanted, I wanted three policy actions <clears throat> that will do two things. Number one, enable us to extract the value that we have uh, placed upon the African continental free trade area. Number two, in general, help lift growth across the continent. I'm going to start with you, Vera. Three. Three. I mean, I think very the quick point. The first sharp one. Point. The first one is trade. We need to do everything that we can to trade more with each other, to trade better. But also, and the second one will be to attract foreign direct investment, because in some sense we need those resources coming from outside. We Nationally or both. regionally both. or both. Sub-Saharan Africa. No, no, no. All of, Afri all of Africa, okay. because we need, his lithium has to be produced with the, in the car manufacturing plant in Morocco and it's going to use some manganese from Central Africa. So I think we do actually need to look at that. That is the power of the continent. Okay. There is no sub, you know, we are all Africa. And I think if we pull that together, we get amazing results out of it. Mm. Uh, but it's trade. Trade has lifted every generation across the world out of poverty and it's going to lift us as well. But in this age, again, back to the supply chains, mm -hmm. the, I think the sort of conversation that we don't talk about, we all heard our saliva on the light of, uh, of the European Union on the opening day, we heard uh, from Klaus, we heard from all these people talking about the need to find stable, resilient, sustainable, strategic supply chains. Mm -hmm. What are they looking for supply chains for? It's palm oil, it's your lithium, it's cobalt, it's manganese. So it's not just to find the chain, mm -hmm. it's to create the product and the value on the continent. And I think Africa has that potential to do that in a way that is sustainable. The private sector across the world is looking to come and do that. There is policy in other jurisdictions, in other geographies, in the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act, yes. $65 billion to find rare minerals, which are lying you know, on the subsurfaces of many of our economies. I think if we began to look at that trade interaction in a different way, we can really do something different. The second thing that we need to make sure that we don't conflate is sort of geopolitics and economics. And, and sort of we're now talking about, and I think the, the governor is, is familiar with this conversation, the new financial architecture. What is the architecture that is going to be appropriate for this century and to take Africa out of it? Mm. Is it an architecture that continues to rely on sort of grant aid and donor aid, or is it an architecture that has Africa being part of the conversation that changes the financial tools that we have, mm. the financial infrastructure to take us out of that. And I think uh, looking for deepening our capital markets, mm. trading more in domestic currencies so that when we have inflationary pressures from other jurisdictions, they don't create debt constraints that we're not sort of part of uh, policy decisions on the continent. And finally, it's about policies. Oh. If we do not put the right policies in place. And this is, so the other two are kind of, you know, we all have to come together, we'll trade, you know, we'll do supply chains, but the policies are ours. We are, you know, you make policy, you decide whether you're going to collect taxes in a good governance environment yeah. with a little bit more transparency using digitization. I think we can do a lot of that. And the better our policies are, yeah. so much faster we will get that growth. Where, where do we have that conversation around uh, our policy reform? Because we are in the age where we're talking about the AFCFTA. And uh, here we are talking about trying to attract foreign direct investment. Do I, as uh, Somalia, stand up and tell my own story? Or do I take that story to the AU 
and therefore we make it universal. So if you are sitting in Singapore and you're thinking, I'd like to go to Africa, you'd know, hopefully, you are approaching a continent with uniform policies. I think that conversation happens, first of all, you've mentioned at the, uh, at the African Union, but we also have Wamkele at the AFCFTA Secretariat. But okay. all of the finance ministers, all of the trade ministers, all of the foreign ministers are ambassadors of that conversation. All of us should be ambassadors of that conversation. Sure. Actually, when one business does well, it crowds in every business, right? If one goes to, you know, Zimbabwe or Rwanda or South Africa, yeah. when, when South Africa did the energy reforms, yeah. everybody went to you guys. Yeah. And then we all know, oh God, solar can do well. And you guys had a little bit of a higher price, so they were at yeah. four cents yeah. in other jurisdictions. Sure. So I think that's the idea, is that they have to be leaders, yeah. and then they become ambassadors for the continent. Yeah, we're running out of time. Minister, do we have those policies? And I would like your three, three very three quickly, quick things, please. I would say, uh, I will focus on beneficiation to harness the full impact of the African free continental trade area. I've mentioned the area of lithium, for example. Just beneficiation, making sure that we can begin to export uh, manufactured goods among ourselves uh, within Africa rather than primary commodities and grow that trade level from average of 15% intra-Africa trade to a much higher figure, 30, 40, 50. Isn't that political, so, Minister? Wouldn't you rather have the private sector look at the opportunity, think, can I do this here or do I need to take they this They need elsewhere? incentives. It is uh, us to... Us I mean, with incentives. We have to give incentives. We have to do that and, and we're trying to do that. The other area is investing in regional infrastructure. Uh, I would say power is critical. Uh, I see, for instance, in Southern Africa, uh, or along the Zambezi River, Mozambique is a great source of hydropower. There are four areas where we could build, you know, hydropower stations with off-take agreements from, you know, uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and, and the region where there's a, a deficit of about 5,000 megawatts of, of power. So regional infrastructure, and, and then it keeps growing. That also includes roads. We may have to do some bit of acid recycling, uh, for, which really means where government is borrowed to build roads, airports, and is now drowning in debt, which is what is happening, by the way. Mm. Th that could be concessioned, those, that infrastructure could be concessioned out to the private sector, and then government receives some money and pays off the credit and the private sector runs it for 30, 40 years sure. on a concession uh, agreement. I mean, that's, that's just some you know, sure. technical work that needs to be done there, but regional infrastructure is, is key. Finally, to, to speak to the point about trade that Vera raised is really a trade finance, specifically trade finance, mm. because uh, Afri African banks tend to be small banks globally. Uh, except Standard Bank, the chairman is here. Um, uh, you know, so, so, so we just need to uh, support in terms of uh, uh, trade finance. We need uh, bigger banks. Mm. We need, uh, uh, I, I, I recall IFC, AFDB during the financial crisis. They actually come up with trade finance facilities yes. where they were enhancing uh, the balance sheets of, of, of African banks for them to, to support a trade finance. Yeah. Uh, because at the moment, you have a situation where the availing banks, the confirming banks, is, let's say, a German bank or, or a global bank, yeah. but you don't have confirming banks within Africa because the balance sheets are small. So that needs to be solved for us to realize the full potential yeah. of trade within Africa. Just three points. Cool. I'm with you. Do the basics. We need a better quality of governance across the continent. Thank um, you. If, gov if governments just did one thing, govern better, we would probably take two steps, three steps forward. Um, we cannot avoid... I wish we had a whole hour to talk about that one. Sure. As part of that governance project, we cannot avoid uh, talking about corruption, tamp down on corruption. It's impossible to get rid of it completely, I agree, uh, or concede. Perhaps it is, perhaps it's not, but <laughs> I concede that from where we are, you have to start from where you are, um, the best we can hope for for now is some focus on this and tamping down on it instead of talking about it. Mm. Um, the third one is around climate. Um, so I think we need to get serious, both actually public and private sector, about what we do in the climate change space. As Africa managed to leapfrog landlines, fixed, fixed line infrastructure in telecoms goes straight into, into mobile, we have an opportunity today to leapfrog fossil fuels for the most part, or South Africa being a special case, of, of course. But out of the 800 Africans alive today, up to 60%, perhaps more, don't have access to reliable True. power supply. How are you going to provide that? You've got plentiful natural resources. Endowments are fantastic. So leapfrog that and go straight into, into um, renewables. Yeah. However, 
I do have to also give a fourth. We do have the commodities. <laughs> just instead of sort of running, let's first walk, yeah. let's extract the commodities we do have yeah. and put the belts and braces and the rules from government around that and the guardrails yeah. in order to do that in the best possible way. We could absolutely kill it yeah. if we extracted all the cobalt and the copper and the nickel that, uh, that, that this, this new new green economy needs. But in doing so, I think we also have to be very cognizant of the fact that Africa then has to increase emissions before we take them down, because it takes energy and it takes emissions of methane and all sorts of things in wow. the mining and the shipping of all of the <clears> commodities. So, so we do have to be a little bit like patient on the pathway to net zero, because yeah. in the initial phases, I can't see how Africa doesn't increase emissions. 100%. <clears throat> I would have loved to engage you to ask if uh, uh, what, what your thoughts are on the Minister on Beneficiation, but another time, another time. Governor? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first uh, countries, all our countries are not similar. So we have 50 odd countries and today and now- I thought yeah, we were all African, Governor. I'm sorry? I thought we were all African. But Africa is not a country. I wanted Africa to be a country. It will not. It's day. not a country. And the differentiation, say, between Tanzania and Kenya, we share border, or Kenya, Somalia, or Kenya, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Namibia, we are really different. That, I think, has to be appreciated. And where we are today in the conjuncture is also very different. So. I think we need to support um, the authorities to get over the conjuncture, whatever the situation is, with regard to the current issues. That is essential. Um, so there, I'm not going to go into the details, but it sure. is important to appreciate. That's number one. Second, very important, look forward 25 years where and see where we are going to be. For instance, we are going to have 60% of, or rather 25% of the world's uh, workers will be in Africa. These are United Nations projections. 60% um, of them will be under the age of 35. So we need to begin to think how, it's not a problem of just the next two years or the next three years, long-term growth. That's the point I'm making. And then bridging that divide is number three which really requires seeing how we are going to move ahead in terms of, let's say, capital. Minister talked about that, infrastructure, but also social capital, um, health, etc. but even education. If these people are going to be, 25% um, of the labor force will be in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, there's a, a lot of investment we need to do there. And finally, in terms of innovation, innovation. There's so much that we have done so far, and this is really one of the elements that we can leverage. So that is the bridge, as it were, the set of issues that bridge um, the today and uh, 30 years from now. Sure. Thank you, uh, Vera. Thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Governor, for your time. And thank you to all of you uh, for joining us uh, uh, this morning. <laughs>